Hi friends, I'm Gio. I'm a guy who likes writing gay fiction. Welcome to my channel. Today we're working on chapter three for speeding. What has gone before? Pete's life is racing out of control, fast. He's about to be evicted because he is a hoarder and his landlord, Linda, has had enough. His mom had set him up on a blind date ignoring the fact that Pete had other plans. Pete also insulted his best friend, Ethan, who had just told Pete he was gay and in love with him. Pete went to Ethan's place to try and apologize, and his day just got worse. Chapter 3 August 3rd, Pete The worst day of the year, maybe of my life, just got worse. Ethan didn't mean to, but he dragged my soul down the proverbial street and made me feel like an asphalt pizza. He didn't have to say a word, and he'd never know what he had done. All I did was walk into his apartment. He is very nice and stylish and organized and clean apartment. How did he do it? Cream-colored walls, cream-colored counters, a beige carpet, a tiled kitchen, light pine cabinets, and a tiled entryway were just like mine if somebody took the time to look under all the clothes and crap and spent the time to clean everything. Those were the only things in this place that were like mine. The air smelled of simmering vanilla and warm brownies. His apartment seemed brighter than my place, like it wanted to welcome me home. I had only stepped one foot in and I didn't want to go back to the ugliness of my apartment. This was a place I'd love to come home to. There was no way Ethan would ever see my apartment. Your place is so clean, I said. How do you do it? The living room had a designer deep beige overstuffed love seat with a matching recliner. A small light wood coffee table with a vase of fresh flowers, a TV stand, and a 36-inch flat screen. The flat screen played some cozy fireplace ASMR with rain in the background. His television was only 36 inches. Ethan could afford a nicer, bigger one. Why didn't he upgrade? Ethan dimmed the lights so the place became cozy and romantic. Are you trying to seduce me? I joked. Ethan gave me a small half grin. And have you running away again? You never know. I might like kissing you, I said, leering at him. Ethan rolled his eyes. Sharing the TV stand were two crystal salt lamps shedding a warm glow. On the wall behind the television were two pictures. On the left side was a framed professional portrait of a younger version of Ethan with his mom and dad taken back in high school. The other was a large framed canvas print of a city on a lake. A small tag on the frame said, Venice, 1908, Claude Monet. Ethan must have spent some money on that one. On the floor, next to the love seat, was Sabretooth's kennel cab, and she lay on a fuzzy pillow, chewing on a chew bone. A couple of doggy toys sat beside her. Sabretooth, a cream-colored purebred shih tzu, looked up once and went back to chewing on the chew bone. Her hair was cut short, but was well combed. She had a top knot on her head, held together with a pink ribbon. Sabretooth isn't making a fuss. Good to know my dog still likes you, Ethan said, walking over and picking up the small dog. You've had her for three years, I think, I said, but you don't bring her to the park too often. I leave her home when it gets hot outside, Ethan said. Welcome to Southern Nevada. It's hot ten months of the year, sometimes eleven, I said. Next to the dog bed was a polished dark wood guitar on a guitar stand. I didn't know instruments, but I bet it cost more than a normal one. How had Ethan gotten so good since the last time I heard him? That's all he had in his living room. My living room? I couldn't even see the floor. My discarded clothes were my carpet. I hate my life. There was a silence in the air when I hadn't noticed. 
Ethan glanced at me, then turned away. What is it? I asked. Why did you run out earlier? Are you ashamed of me because I'm gay? Ethan said. But he didn't look at me, and his voice dropped almost to a whisper. The serious conversation was back. I reached into my pocket, pulled my phone out, and turned it off before I spoke. I did not want Mom, Cindy, Dad, or anybody interfering with my life right now. You surprised me, I said, putting my phone away. If I told Ethan about Mom's phone call and Cindy's text and me getting evicted, he'd think I was making excuses. If I told him about my problems, I'd tell him this weekend when we played basketball. I guess I needed a moment, because it changes everything. I mean, it doesn't, but it does. You're you, but you're a different you, but you're still the same you. Does that make sense? I said. It's your turn to not make sense tonight, Ethan said, and slightly shook his head. His dining room was simple, a small table with an iron and a tabletop ironing board on it, four chairs, and another vase of fresh flowers. I guess they went on the table, but for now they were on the kitchen counter. That's all he had in the dining room. I mean, you're in love with me, but not like a friend, but I don't know but romantically in love with me. I know in my head that that is natural and a lot of guys fall in love with each other and I feel honored and I've known lots of gay people, but no one has ever gotten close to me like that, I said, turning to look at the painting and not at Ethan. For some reason, I couldn't explain what I felt. I didn't want to upset my best friend, but I didn't know how to tell the truth. Things are different because I don't know how to joke around or say things with you. I mean, what if I cross the line and say something accidentally insulting and don't know it? What if I say something that offends you or is inappropriate? That bothers you, Ethan said. It's hard to explain, I said. It only means that I know you, but I don't know you, but you're the same person you've always been. How am I supposed to act? It's like moving into a new house. It seems like everything should be the same, and it kind of is, but it isn't. I walked into his kitchen. The stainless steel appliances and the light wood of the cupboards gleamed. The kitchen was also clean and clutter-free. Ethan only had a shining French press coffee maker, a microwave, a fire extinguisher, two kitchen towels neatly folded by the stainless steel sink, and a regular clock. On the floor were saber-tooths, stainless steel dishes. Ethan set Sabretooth on the floor and refilled the water dish before squatting down and ruffling the dog's fur. I don't know what the new boundaries are. How do I treat you? I said. Treat me like a normal person, Ethan said. With an apartment looking this good, are you even normal? I said, trying to lighten the atmosphere. Ethan sort of smiled and took his work shirt, iron, and tabletop ironing board and disappeared into the bedroom. He came back a second later and pulled two plates out of the cupboard and set the table. From a drawer, he pulled out two steak knives and forks. Then he put the flowers on the table. Pete, I haven't changed. I'm the same person I've always been, Ethan said. I know, it's just that. I see you different now, and I don't want to lose my best friend because it's fun talking to you and doing things with you, I said. What had I seen in the cupboard? More accurately, what had I not seen? I opened the cupboard again. It was almost empty. Three bowls, three plates if you counted the two already on the table, three mugs, three glasses, and two wine glasses. I'm afraid of losing you, Ethan said. It will sound weird, but you're important to me, maybe more than my parents. Is this the part where you say you love me, and it gets all kinds of awkward? Because I'm not ready for that. Can we simply leave it at, you're gay, I'm straight, we're friends. I'm sorry for the way I acted, and I'll be more supportive in the future. We'll always be close friends. I'll tell you about my dates with girls, you tell me about your dates with guys, we'll shoot the hoops, help each other with cars, and life, even be the best man at each other's weddings, I said. 
Will you let me win on Saturday? Ethan said. Don't push it, I said. I opened the drawer. Ethan had barely any silverware. The oven timer beeped, and Ethan pulled the brownies from the oven and set them on the counter. His fresh baked cheesecake brownies. The aroma of gooey chocolate sent delicious shivers up and down my spine. Are you moving? I blurted out. No, I re signed my lease a month ago. I have almost another year, he said, turning the oven off. Where's all your stuff? I asked. In the bedroom closet, except for my bike, and that is in the second bedroom, Ethan said. You live in a two bedroom apartment with nothing? It's empty, I said. It's not empty. It's filled with happiness, Ethan said. Good thing I like you because you are certifiably insane, I said, and opened a cupboard that didn't have anything in it. I set the takeout containers on the table. Ethan divided out the food between the two plates. I need to hear the words. Just tell me we're still friends, okay? We'll somehow work through this, I said. I think couples counselors would say we are opening a whole new phase in our friendship, Ethan said, holding out one of the steak knives. After a couple of weekends of me beating you at basketball, we'll be an old married couple. Good. I'm glad that's settled, but I'm not marrying you. Your schedule would drive me crazy. I couldn't eat yet, not until I saw if the rest of Ethan's apartment was like the kitchen and dining room. I set the steak knife by my plate. Take me on the tour. Tia is going to be mad at me tomorrow, Ethan said, shrugged, and led the way down a short corridor. Two doors were opposite each other, and one at the far end. This is the second bedroom, and he led me into the door on the right. It had his bike and his helmet. And that's it. I walked to the closet. Empty. What happened to all your stuff? I asked. I have what I need, he said. I would never invite Ethan over. If he ever learned how I lived, he would judge me and I would lose my best friend. Ethan led me across the hall to the master bedroom. It had a large bed decorated with a patterned burgundy comforter that looked expensive, two regular pillows, and two show pillows that matched the comforter. Beside the bed were two nightstands, both with a lamp. The nightstand closest to the door had another vase of flowers and a picture of Ethan with a guy I had never met. Who is that? I asked. Spencer, my ex, he said. Why did he leave? Actually, we never lived together. He was supposed to move in with me. That's why we had the extra bedroom. It was for his clothes. Among other things, Spencer had trouble with how I kept one foot in the closet, Ethan said. Some people know I'm gay, some people don't. Spencer wanted someone who was out and proud all the time, waving the flag and marching in the Vegas Pride Parade. You didn't? I asked. I had to work, Ethan said. Days off for an ambulance driver are kind of difficult. There's no one to cover for us except somebody on another shift or one of the firemen. It's easier just to go to work. At least Spencer had plenty of room for his stuff, I said. Ethan shrugged. Not until you saw how many shoes he had. Where's all your books, your DVDs, your knickknacks and mementos? They must be in your closet. May I? I asked. I was being really nosy, and we both knew it. I couldn't help myself. Fortunately, Ethan opened the closet for me. Less than half of the closet held his things, and he didn't even need that much. His vacuum, a laptop, a printer, work shoes, basketball shoes, sandals. On a part of one shelf, he had his folded t-shirts, folded muscle shirts. He had 1% of the clothes I did. He had some papers, one book, no DVDs, and a couple of squirt bottles for cleaning supplies. On another shelf was the six-inch metal Lamborghini I had given him on his 18th birthday. That was the only thing on that shelf. Another shelf had a medical kit, a straight razor, some neatly folded towels, his folded boxer briefs, and folded socks. 
Who folds their underwear? When had I folded anything? The closet was 90% empty. Compared to mine, it was 990% empty. There was no way I would ever let Ethan see my place. I fought the growing shame. My place would never look like this. Ethan was so lucky. Was it a flood, a fire? Did it destroy everything you had? I asked. Do you have an off-site storage unit? Ethan smiled. No, 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 and no, in that order. Are you ready to eat? No. I walked into the bathroom, staying ahead of Ethan so he wouldn't see my face. Seeing his place, how neat and organized he was, made me feel inferior. Ethan could sleep anywhere in his apartment. I could only sleep in a tiny piece of my living room. Ethan didn't have to worry about being evicted. I could never tell him about that, not after seeing his place. Except for a couple of folded towels and folded washcloths and a bottle of body wash, there was nothing in the bathroom. I stared at my best friend. I know I made a goofy look because of the smile he gave me. I couldn't help it. You don't have anything. Are you from another planet? How do you live? What's your secret? I live very well, thank you, Ethan said. You wouldn't believe my secret. His balcony was just off the master bedroom. I slid open the sliding glass door and looked out. It had only the two chairs, two pillows, the plants, and the drying laundry. Everybody thinks how I live is weird, but I can explain, Ethan said, stopped at his closet to grab something, and then led us back to our food. He put the flowers back on the counter, brought out a candle holder and a long, thin candle, found some matches, and lit the candle. Dinner by candlelight, I said. I wanted to prove that I have everything I need, Ethan said, and placed a paper on the table, even something for special dinners. Maybe I could learn something from Ethan, though I would never tell him that. Share. What's your secret? It's simple. I made a list of everything. My insurance has a copy, and my mom, and I keep one in a safety deposit box with my will and other important papers. If anything happens to me, or my apartment, everybody will know exactly what was here. You made a list of everything you own? That's impossible, I said. Not when you limit yourself to 200 things, Ethan said, or less. That's my secret. 200 things? Nobody can live on that, I said. Ethan only shrugged again and spun the list around to look at it, then spun it around again so it faced me. Take it with you and read it. Saturday, right before we play basketball. Tell me what I am missing. I read over the list. It had everything, from furniture to clothes to dishes and a lot of other stuff. His car, towels, vases, flashlight, pen, notebook, his bike, even the dashboard sunscreen for his car. No, I don't believe that's all you have. Most apartments have a storage closet, and it's probably crammed with things. I want to see what you're hiding, I said. Okay, Ethan said and shrugged and took me outside. Between his unit and the one next to his were four doors, each labeled for a different apartment. Ethan unlocked his, turned the light on, and stepped out of the way. It was a large, empty closet. I walked in. It echoed, clean and empty. Imagine the things I could store in here. What a waste of space. Is it in your car? Did you hide it in your trunk? I asked. I don't store anything in my car, Ethan said, and you shouldn't either. Why? It's a portable room and office and bedroom and whatever, I said. There are several reasons. I have a friend on the police department, Officer Lopez, and he was talking the other day. If people knew how much thieves look through the car windows at apartment complexes, shopping centers, churches, and any other place that has a lot of cars, they'd stop storing things in their car immediately. Really? I said. 
It only takes a second for somebody to see if there's something they want on your car. Let's suppose a thief sees something interesting on your back seat. Let's say it's your laptop. They can either break the window or bypass the lock by sliding a specialized metal hook down the inside of your window. Either way, they can be in your car in seconds and gone seconds later. What about alarms? I asked. Alarms keep honest people honest. Besides, who listens to them anymore? Ethan said. Are there any other reasons? I asked. I've been at too many car accidents. When you have a sudden stop, let's say from 30 miles an hour to zero, everything in your car goes flying. Let's say you have groceries in your back seat. Guess what goes bouncing around your car? Now let's say you're traveling at 50 and you hit a car coming at you at 50. Suddenly, the momentum is like hitting a brick wall at 100 miles an hour. What happens to the groceries? How would you like to get hit in the back of the head with a can of soup traveling at 100 miles an hour? I had to crawl through the back seat of a car after an accident to help support a woman while the fire crew cut the door open. Guess what had hit her? An apple. Guess what hit one of her kids? A bag of kitty litter. I'm sure that felt good. Guess what hit her other kid and broke his nose? The first kid. He wasn't wearing a seat belt and bounced like a ping-pong ball with everything else not fastened down. So you keep your car clean and empty in case of accidents, I said. Is that why you drive so slow? I've seen what driving fast does to people when they lose control, Ethan said. The ambulance drivers who drive fast and crazy don't last long. As a driver, you have to balance the risk of driving through a red light with the urgency of the patient you're carrying. Between texting, talking on the phone, using your phone to track down an address. A lot of people don't pay attention when they drive. After dinner, if you want to get grossed out, I'll tell you a few stories about some of the accidents I've been at. We went back to the food. I had a lot to think about. Thieves, speeding, clean cars. At least Mom wasn't yelling and Cindy wasn't texting. If you only have 200 things, how can you survive? I read through the list again and again. It had everything he needed, even his toothbrush. Most people barely use 1% of what they own. I only keep what I use or cherish, and I toss anything I don't use, he said, cutting his steak. Are you saying that people have 20,000 things, I said. Some people have a lot more, he said. Ever hear of hoarders? You wouldn't believe some of the houses I've had to get the stretcher into. Ethan didn't mean it to, but his comments stung. I easily had more than 20,000 things, but I would never tell Ethan that. Did I have 200,000 things or more? How would I move it by August 31st? The fear and shame hit me. I couldn't tell anybody about my apartment. I can't let Ethan know what I've done. I don't want him to be ashamed of me or pity me. He must never know. Nobody I know lives like this. Why do you, I said, focusing on my steak so I wouldn't have to look at my best friend. It's a long story, but the simple answer is, if you can't take care of it, why keep it around, Ethan said. Because you might need it some day, I said. Let me tell you a little secret, Ethan said. That's a lie. You'll never need it, and on the remote chance you actually do, You'd rather buy a new and improved one than search for the old. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I appreciate it. Peace.